I was somewhat of a seeker for truth, but I wasn't even really sure there even was a truth. Somebody over here could believe in one thing and that was his truth. Somebody over here could believe in something else and that was his truth. And it didn't matter if they were totally opposite of each other. The argument is that there's no absolute point. There's no Archimedean point which you could stand over and look down and judge. You know, that's your truth, that's fine, that's true for you. And that's your truth, that's fine, that's true for you. And there is no absolute truth. And the philosophy of the last half of the 20th century has often been called postmodern. The philosophy of postmodernism basically says that truth depends upon your point of view. In other words, truth, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, which raises an interesting question. Is one person's view of God inherently any better than another's? Is there clear, objective evidence that God even exists? I'm Dwight Nelson. Let's take a look at the evidence. From whenever you can start thinking about these things, I guess I have wondered about some of the basic questions, you know, what is the purpose of life, you know, why am I here, you know. I wasn't really on any kind of formal intellectual quest, but I did do a lot of traveling. It was just my way of looking for something. I don't know if I could even define what it was, but I was looking and I would just travel and meet people and learn about cultures. I remember too at times I could be with my friends and we were be in a restaurant or a bar and whatever they're talking about and I would always bring up, well do you think there's maybe a God or something and they go, oh no, Gold Cliff's on his God thing again, even though I was probably the most secular or the most atheistic one there would be. I was aware of the implications of what it would mean if there really did turn out to be a God and so that was something that was always kind of churning. To, in my mind to some degree or another. Life-changing experiences sometimes occur in the strangest places. One of the most profound changes of Clifford Goldstein's life took place in a pizza parlor. I can remember I was sitting in this pizza parlor eating a pizza and drinking a beer or whatever and I was reading this philosopher Spinoza and he said something that changed my life right there in the pizza parlor. In order to live the most perfect life upon the earth, you, need, you needed to find out the reason why you're here and live your life accordingly. Well, it was amazing. It was like those words were almost a prefrontal lobe lobotomy. It's like they went right into my mind. And at that time, all the relativism, all the postmodernism, all the stuff that I had been raised on my whole life got wiped out, just like zoom, like those neurons were wiped out. And at that moment, it suddenly hit me that there had to be a truth. Look, here was a pizza sitting here on the table in front of me. Now, there could have been, you could take a thousand people and a thousand people could have come with a thousand different explanations for how they believe the pizza got there. Maybe the god Marduk created it. Maybe an alien dropped it out of a spacecraft. Maybe it evolved. They could have had all these different views on how the pizza got there. And they could have believed them so fervently they'd be willing to die or even kill for their view how the pizza got there. Maybe they'd start religions, you know, on their belief on how the pizza got there. But it hit me, they couldn't all be true. And maybe they all were wrong, but somewhere there had to have been an explanation for the pizza. I mean, this thing was there. It had to have an origin. And that origin, whatever it was, would have been the, quote, truth about the pizza. It just totally changed me, the sudden realization that there had to be an explanation for, for the world. And that explanation, whatever it was, in the same way the explanation for the pizza, whatever that would be, would be the truth about the pizza in the same way the explanation for the world and for me and for how the world got here, that would be the truth. I remember walking out of the pizza parlor and I was walking through the streets and I remember thinking, if it were humanly possible, because even though I knew that it, an explanation had to exist, I realized it might not be possible to know it, but I thought if it were humanly possible to know what that explanation was, I wanted to know, I wanted to know it. I didn't care where it led me, what it cost me, what I had to suffer, what I had to give up. 
I, now that I knew that there had to be a truth, whatever it was, I thought, oh, I wanted to know it no matter what. Cliff's pursuit of truth took him to some surprising places and brought some unexpected sacrifices. Because in addition to his interest in philosophy and pizza, Cliff Goldstein was writing a novel. I've had novelists in my family, writers and editors in my family, and by the time I was 12, 13, I just knew I was going to write novels. And all I ever did was read novels. I read nonstop, and uh, I had started a novel my senior year at college. And before long, this book just became my life. It consumed my life. I didn't even care about my relationship with other people. Nothing mattered. I lived my life with one question, how is doing this or not doing whatever I'm doing, or this relationship entering or not being in this relationship, how will that impact my writing of the book? And then I had decided at one point that uh, I was going to go over to Europe and work on the novel in Europe, because that was part of the background to the novel. And I hitchhiked down through Europe and wound up in Greece, and then kind of on a fluke even, I ended up going to Israel. And I lived in Israel for a year and worked on the novel there for a while. Then I went back to Europe and worked on it. All I wanted to do was find somewhere where I could live and work on and work on the book. Clifford's pursuit of his novel competed with his pursuit of absolute truth until a spiritual experience created a dichotomy in the meaning of Clifford's life. I had reached a point in my life where I really had reached the bottom. I had really had reached the bottom, and I was probably the most depressed I'd ever been. And there was one time where I actually even thought about committing suicide. And the moment I had that thought, another thought popped into my mind was, hang on, maybe this Jesus stuff is true. And it's almost like that thought came in and popped the thought of suicide out of my mind. Yet as soon as I had that thought, I just cursed myself. And I said, look at you. Your whole life you always viewed religious people as weak people. Oh, they couldn't handle the hard knocks of life, and so they had some little invisible bunny rabbit that they said their prayers to before they went to bed at night, and they prayed, and it made them feel better, and oh, and that made them, you know, wasn't that nice? And I always had the most utter disdain for people like that. I thought that was so weak, and so I hated that. And now suddenly, for the first time in my life, I felt like I couldn't handle it, and I was going to do the same thing, reach out to some fake God or something to make me feel better, and I said, no way. I was too honest a seeker for truth to reach out and believe a lie, no matter how good the lie made me feel. In other words, I would rather have lived with no hope than a false hope. I'd rather have this happen to me in Paris, and I thought about jumping off the Eiffel Tower, and I thought I'd rather jump off the Eiffel Tower and be dead rather than live a lie, no matter how good the lie made me feel. And I remember stopping there and just almost like shaking my fist up in the sky, and I said, no way. I'm too honest a seeker to believe a lie just because it makes me feel better. I said, God, if you're there, you have to reveal yourself to me. You know, the Bible says you can turn water into wine and drop bread out of the sky and the dead be raised and all that's fine. If you're there, you have to reveal yourself to me, and then I'll believe. Otherwise, I'll never believe ever. Daddy's home. Hey. Mm -hmm. Hey. Come here, you. Oh. Long day. Oh, yeah. So just relax tonight. I can't. It's boy night. i tell you what. If you could think of something really fun to do, I'll stay home tonight. Okay? Okay, okay. Not gonna make it tonight. It's a bad hair day, so. Give your family everything. Looking good. Give them your time. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. <laughs> Hello. The job market is a competitive place. In today's economy, extra skills mean a better job for you. Speaking English is the skill you need for greater opportunity, more money, and a brighter future. Introducing Hello Channel, an exciting new television channel that teaches English as you watch TV. There's something for everyone, and the more you watch, the faster you'll learn. All you have to do is say hello.
As Clifford Goldstein searched for truth, he found a belief in God. What he didn't expect is what that belief would cost him. One night, out of the blue, I had this powerful experience with God, and basically what the Lord said to me was, it's either me or this book. You can have no other gods before me. See, this book, it wasn't that the book was evil in and of itself, but it was my relationship to the book. This book was my life, and I realized that God had to come first, and it boiled down to where if I wanted the Lord, the book had to go. And the thing that I remember clearly more than anything was I had free choice. In other words, I didn't have to burn this book. God was saying, if you want me, you want a truth, here I am, but this book is going to have to go because that's your God. And, and it, was, it was kind of a very involved struggle, but in the end, I made the choice and I burned. I ultimately burned that book, and that was a night my life changed forever. It wasn't, quote, logical. It wasn't rational, for lack of a better word. It was just a very personal thing that I have that, that you know, changes my life. In a sense, I'm broken. I'm broken, and, and, and my clinging to the world, this thing that meant to me the most, this book, I destroyed it. I burned it, and it was like I, I was severed my connection from the world. It was almost a way to describe it. I burned that book. I gave up my writing. I realized I might not ever write again. And then within a year or two later, I started writing again, and I've been writing for almost nonstop for 18, 19 years since. I ended up right after that, I met some people in a health food store and who were believers, and I told them about what happened. And they said, you want to study the Bible? And I said, yeah, and what do you want to study? They said, I said, I want to study prophecy. And they immediately took me to Daniel 2. And this was, you know, it's, it's an amazing story, Daniel 2. And basically, it's, it's funny, there's two parts to it. You've got this whole section where this king has a dream, when he's very upset, and he calls all these wise men in and tells them, tell me what the dream is, interpret the dream for me. They, of course, they can't tell the guy what the dream is. He, they don't even, he doesn't even remember the dream himself. So he threatens to kill them all, and then he's going to kill among them, the, you know, Daniel and some of the other Hebrew captives. And Daniel goes, prays, and in the vision in the night, Daniel is shown the truth of the king's dream, and he tells the king the dream. The king saw a statue just a statue of a man, and the head was of gold, and this was symbolic of Babylon. The arms and breasts were silver. This was symbolic of Medo-Persia, the next kingdom. The belly and thighs were brass. That was the next kingdom, Greece. The legs were iron. That was the next kingdom, Rome. And the feet were iron and clay mixed together. Well, that, after the Roman Empire collapsed, you got the nations of modern Europe. So you've got the sweep of world history starting from five, six hundred years before Christ up through the time that we're living in today. I have something here that shows me, show, I can come back to it anytime I want, that shows me the reality of God because it shows me that not only is God in control of the nations, but God can tell the future. And so I see here, I've got, in my mind, it's irrefutable evidence. And I figure if this God is in control of all that and knows all that, then he certainly could handle anything that comes in my life. See, prior to that experience, you know, I had read the Bible. I had people had given me the Bible, but I, I tried to read the Bible. I never got past the talking snake story in, in Genesis. I thought the Bible was the rantings and ravings of a bunch of flea-bitten camel herders. They got tired of lugging these big stone idols around the desert, so they made up some notion of some god they could see, said he was one, named him Yahweh, and that was the religion of the Bible. They were, it was late Bronze Age camel herder myths. But then I met personally the God of the Bible. I met the God of the Bible. Clifford Goldstein had a powerful, personal, life-changing experience, but he wanted that experience to be grounded in objective reality. For him, the prophecy of Daniel 2 gave him just what he needed. We'll learn more about that prophecy, the one that changed his life, right after this. Hello. That's right, I said hello. I'm talking about an exciting new television channel that will change your life. My name is Ruth, and I want you to be one of the first to know about Hello Channel. Hello Channel is designed to teach you to speak English. Anyone can learn. 
we offer something for everyone. You'll see programming for children, teenagers, and adults, all on different levels. With Hello Channel, you'll hear, see, read, and speak English as you're watching entertaining television programs, making it easy to learn. If you've always wanted to learn English, but haven't had a chance, Hello Channel is perfect for you. Start today and remember, for a brighter future, just say hello. I'm delighted to have my friend Dr. Jacques Ducan here at The Evidence today. Welcome, Jacques. Thank you. Why is it that prophecy can have such a profound effect upon the reader? When you come to biblical prophecy, mm -hmm. why it is, has an effect on you, it is because suddenly you realize that God, the invisible God, the one you don't see and you don't have any tangible evidence, is in fact uh, uh, present in history so, among us. So you're making a distinction between biblical prophecy and the supermarket tabloids, you know the prophet yeah. Nostradamus. The, uh, there's a big yeah, there would be uh, interest publicly in in prophecy today. But yeah. you're saying there's a difference between biblical prophecy and and uh, the, the popularized versions. Yeah, I would say the the main uh, difference uh, had been noticed already by uh, Flavius Josephus, this Jewish historian from the early century, the mm -hmm. first century. Mm -hmm. He was uh, observing uh, prophecies in general, and he said, well, in, even biblic within biblical prophecy, he said, Daniel is the greatest prophet. And the reason why he was saying that is that he observed that Daniel added to his predictions figures. He did not just... Uh, it was just generic it was not, it was, it was not just. It was future. not just, yeah, speaking about, okay. you know, vaguely about the future, but he, he ran risk and he, he gave figures uh, about these predictions. Uh, of course, there are some people who are, uh, I mean, some, I mean, Australians, to a certain extent, it gives also figures, but what, what would be the difference here is that those figures correspond to the reality. I mean, you can, you can check them. So he's not some kind of a, a religious wacko or a no. fanatic that has just no. kind of moaned and groaned yeah. over some sort of prophetic word. Yeah, and this is why he realized that he doesn't have naturally the answer. Mm. And the only way for him to get the answer is not to seek the answer within himself, but to look for the answer, to ask for an answer for, from someone who would have the answer. And this is why he's praying. And he says in Daniel 2, he received the answer from God. That's right. Now, how do we know that, in fact, he received the answer from God? Because there are some. And well, be, but, but Jacques, hold on just a minute. Yes. It, it'd be very easy to conclude that prophecy is just history written with the future tense. Yeah. Okay, history's already happened. Now I'm going to put will, will, when I already know it's happened, and it'll look like prophecy. Yeah. First of all, uh, from, the te from the book itself, Nebuchadnezzar realizes that the explanation of his dream will be the right explanation because he suddenly realized that the dream he understood because he had the dream, he recognizes mm -hmm. the dream the, when he hears it in the lips from the mouth of, of Dan. So, that, so, so that's the first, the first uh, answer I would say. Now, because I'm going to say, look, it, a guy writing it 300 years later could easily make, make Nebuchadnezzar recognize the dream and just make the story neatly fit. Yeah. So how do you explain that? Uh, you know, with regards to the book of Daniel, we have a controversy, and you are pointing the finger on it. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, the book of Daniel has been written in the 2nd century B.C. He could not have written, it, it remains still a prophecy because he has spoken about four kingdoms, and he has spoken, uh, and the four kingdoms, being in the third kingdom, that is uh, the Greece, he, has, he could not speak about the fourth kingdom, that is Rome. So it's still a prophetic... It's still, yes. And, and when you Future see the way, the way he's talking about the fourth kingdom, followed by uh, another kingdom, which is made of a uh, uh, combination of the religious and the political, mm. uh, when you look at the history, uh, you see that it fits very well. So Cliff Goldstein, you know the story. Yes. He's in this... Uh, you know, he has this, this awakening, as it were, goes to the 
the, the prophecy, the ancient prophecy, and experiences the divine as he reads it. Is it possible for a third millennial human being to pick up that same ancient document and experience something existential, something that happens within him or within her? How, how, could, how could that be? Uh, if there is one place within the Bible, which is a holy, sacred book, which seems to be very far away, old book, mm -hmm. dusty, mm -hmm. completely irrelevant, if there is one book which, in fact, makes this statement to us today in postmodern, this is the book of Daniel. Mm. It is the fact that spirituality, I mean, prayer, the religious, the mystical, mm -hmm. all these things which seems to, for most of us, far away and strange, mm -hmm. in fact, for the book of Daniel, uh, from the point of view of the book of Daniel, this spirituality is put in the flesh of history, in the flesh, in the flesh of existence. It is not something apart from reality. You believe that that is evidence for God? God cannot give an evidence of himself. The only evidence God gives to humans is other humans or human history. This is the only visible thing we have. Biblical prophecy is telling us, look at history. Look at human testimonies. They are the evidence of God. So uh, we, we are, we are supposed in this course of history, when we look at history, I mean, honestly, we are supposed to recognize out there the evidence of the heavenly God in earthly history. And this is one of the points of the book of Daniel. Jacques, what a pleasure to have you with us on the evidence. I Thank pleasure. you for what you've shared with us. In fact, if you would like to examine more carefully the research Dr. Dukan has done in the area of ancient prophecy. This book, his book, Secrets of Daniel, is available at our website. Let me put our website address on the screen for you, theevidenceoneword.tv. You can go to that same website if you'd like more of Clifford Goldstein's story. If you want to interface ancient prophecy with life in the third millennium, check out that website. I'll be back in a few moments for some concluding thoughts. something really fun to do, I'll stay home tonight. Okay? Okay, okay. Annie, could you get that? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not gonna make it tonight. It's a bad hair day, so. Give your family everything. Looking good. Give them your time. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> hello. That's right, I said hello. I'm talking about an exciting new television channel that will change your life. My name is Ruth, and I want you to be one of the first to know about Hello Channel. Hello Channel is designed to teach you to speak English. Anyone can learn. We offer something for everyone. You'll see programming for children, teenagers, and adults, all on different levels. With Hello Channel, you'll hear, see, read, and speak English as you're watching entertaining television programs, making it easy to learn. If you've always wanted to learn English, but haven't had a chance, Hello Channel is perfect for you. Start today and remember, for a brighter future, just say hello. We've gone today from a pizza parlor in 20th century Florida to the ancient kingdom of Babylon in the 6th century BC. We've gone from the subjective personal encounter of one man with God to an impressive prophecy based on something as firm and objective as world history itself. 
It's been an incredible journey. The question, though, remains, what does all of this mean? What it means, at least to me, is this. Whatever our relationship with God, no matter how meaningful our experiences with Him, we can build that relationship on a solid foundation, a foundation that can't be moved, it can't be shaken by the various political or social or philosophical winds that blow down our streets and the cold alleyways of our communities. I believe that anyone open-minded, anyone truly seeking answers to life's most important questions, will find in Daniel 2 powerful evidence for the existence of God and His involvement in the affairs of this world. But don't take my word for it. Open the text for yourself. Read them for yourself. Ask yourself, how could these things have been portrayed so accurately if no God revealed them? And then finally ask yourself, ask yourself some real hard questions about life. Not about life in general, but about your own life. Where is it going? And whether you want to continue to live on your own or instead have the same God who could predict the history of the world with such accuracy guide your life as well. Tough questions, life-changing questions, important questions to be sure, but questions you can't afford to put off forever, especially if forever isn't far away. For the evidence, I'm Dwight Nelson.